Hey, and according to my calculations, it is uh, just about nine o'clock and we are live with uh, Pop Goes the Cultures, Ask Them Yourself. We're back after quite a bit of time. And today we have a great uh, show for you. Today we have two creators who are legendary mad creators and uh, both when Mad Magazine stopped publishing mostly original content, uh, they decided to do their own thing on Kickstarter. So today we've got Desmond Devlin and Tom Richmond, uh, who created a, a nice little thing called uh, Claptrap. And guys, welcome to the to the show, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> hey, Dave. <laughs> yeah, thanks, David. Glad to be here. So, talk to me. Tell me what what's what. I, I've got my Claptrap here. I bought it. I bought the upside down version. Uh, <laughs> The Australian um, edition, yeah. The Australian edition. Um, but I also, I know you can read it backwards uh, in honor of uh, Israel. So <laughs> it's a nice piece of work here. Uh, you both worked for Mad Magazine for quite some time. You both became a part of the usual gang of idiots, which is really kind of cool. Um, I, mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to be kind of a footnote, a little sort of thanks to Des. I was sort of a, a sort of an honorary member of the uh, usual gang of idiots because I got to to do some stuff with him. But let's talk about claptrap and let's talk about the origins of claptrap because that's kind of I'm going to give it to you guys to sort of tell that story, uh, starting with I guess the the end of Mad as a uh, as a thing. Yeah, that was the origin of claptrap. You know, <laughs> as Mad drifted out, we drifted in. Okay, well that was easy. Okay, thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> That's not happened. <laughs> well, tell, no. tell, tell, give me, give me, give me the Reader's Digest version of this. Give me the the lengthier version. That was a. Well, me or you? <laughs> uh, well, when you know they announced in two thousand, what was it, nineteen? Yeah. That uh, they were going to stop doing original content. They well, one of the things they did almost right away was they stopped the movie parodies and the TV parodies. They were still going to do some like 25% original content or something, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> movie and TV parodies weren't going to be part of it anymore. That was the first thing they said was going, you know, they, yeah, they were going to cut, but they knew that we weren't going to do more of those, <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't, I'm not exactly sure why that is. Maybe it was because it just takes so long to do those and a lot of time, you know, costs not, more money, more, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so 
you know, Des and I were like, man, you know, that's <laughs> that's what we love to do. I mean, I do a lot of other stuff, and Des has written many other pieces, but the the parodies were always, you know, the the thing that was my favorite thing to do. So we started kicking around the idea of maybe doing some uh, of our own and and doing it in some format. Um, we really didn't have a handle on what we wanted to do, but we, we discussed it and, uh, we and then eventually, it, so. yeah, eventually that, uh, evolved into doing the crowdfunding thing on Indiegogo to see if we could put it together and make it work. The first thing I'm going to ask you is, is how did you come up with the, uh, with the name Claptrap? No, um, we were just batting names around. I gave Tom some, Tom gave me some and. That's the one we like the best. I mean, there's not a great story behind it. We, we yeah. What were we some of the other? Okay, what were some of the ones you rejected? Oh, I, I don't remember anymore. <laughs> Anything? I'd have to. I'd have to go back through all the all the emails. Yeah, and, I mean, and, like, uh, I, I could research it for you, but not today. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was it was the best name. It's basically there were, there were names. You know, they had certain qualities to them that were okay, but you know, we, nothing. That was the one that clicked. I mean, that's all we can really tell you. So yeah. And the, well, and the minute that the minute that one got suggested, um, I immediately thought of the logo uh, using the different um, identifiable, you know, elements from famous movie posters and and uh, uh, and mm -hmm. and logos. That's um, it. <laughs> yeah, and I just it just it it just uh, seemed perfect. <clears throat> it was fun to to put that together and. You know, claptrap is supposed to be a hodgepodge, a goofiness, and and uh, you know the definition fit well, and um, and uh, the logo worked out really well, and, and so it was. I, I think that we had already started the Star Wars parody before, maybe before we even had that title. Actually, can't remember. That's entirely possible. We, we yeah. knew that we were going to do Star Wars first because when Mad shut down the parodies. It was literally like right. about a month before the last Star Wars movie came out. So that was like the first major movie that Mad was not going to do that they ordinarily obviously would have done. And I know people told me, and Tom, I think Tom got the same reaction. Some people say, oh, it's terrible. They've, been, they've read all the Star Wars parodies going back to 1977. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the last one they're not going to get. And, you know, there's, you know, whether they're Mad fans or Star Wars fans, it's different, but... Um, so they were you know, regretful that you know the timing of Mads, you know, mostly shutdown, right? Was gonna cost them that parody. So that was one when we were discussing the idea itself. We, we were talking about the Star Wars thing. This is probably the first one we do. We thought we'd be doing half new movies and half old movies. The Star Wars was just coming out. It was coming. In fact, it wasn't just coming out. We talked about, but we knew that was one we we're going to tackle right. right away, and we put it forward because we knew there was a demand for it. <laughs> Yeah, and then there were no more new movies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we were we were just coming up with the idea when the pandemic hit, you know. So it was early 2020 that we were really talking about it and getting serious about it. And then all of a sudden there was this right. pandemic and well, suddenly there was plenty, everybody was stuck at home anyway. So yeah, I think we thought there'd be 10 parodies in the book, it'd be five old ones and five new ones. I mean, the old ones, we did a parody before Mad shut everything down of um, a Christmas story. And oh. now, at that point, I think it was like 35 years since the movie or something. But um, they thought it was a good idea. And so they we did it. It turned out well, I thought. I know other people uh -huh. thought so. Um, and there was a little badge in the corner. It said, Movies Mad Missed. And they put, and oh. it was sort of like a little logo they created. I think, and I'm assuming from what I heard, is there are plenty to do like at least one of those a year? Like they go back, they pick out a movie that never got parodied and mad at the time it came out. Mm -hmm. And so whether I or Tom would be the ones to do it or not, who knows? But that was a, and then, but right after that was when things started closing down. So yeah, that was. I remember having a conversation with Bill Morrison, who who was the editor in chief or VP of editorial or whatever when they moved right. to the West Coast. <laughs> And that was that was his idea to do these famous movies or ones that had become cult classics or right. maybe Mad didn't do it because for whatever reason the timing, uh, you know, of it. Um, and, and sometimes uh, it was timing. Sometimes the movies weren't that successful yeah. at the time, but you know, had legs. 
Right, 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 right. So what was the reaction overall when you guys said, okay, if you're not going to do mad, we're going to do mad? Um, reaction from who? Like, uh, well, from, from, from the powers that be at, oh. at whatever was left at mad and from friends, uh, colleagues and fans. Well, we haven't heard from the powers that be. I mean, there's no reason to, you know, um, the idea of parody is not something one company owns, but, um, people at mad, like so the editors, uh, people from Burbank, the people, you know, gotten a copy of the book for themselves. So, yeah, they don't seem to resent it. <laughs> No, I'm just wondering if, like, you know, if there was any kind of um, uh, anybody saying, oh, you know, was, were people encouraging? Were people uh, skeptical? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say skeptical. They're sort of thinking it's, it's, it'd be quite a project. Yeah, they, you know, they thought, you know, you know we, we, we originally thought we'd get this done in a little over a year. And some people thought we wouldn't. And they were right. So <laughs> <laughs> and that's, a, yeah. and that kind of, that's a skepticism about the product itself or about our abilities, but more along those lines. <laughs> well, what yeah, did no, you I, yeah, good. Most, mo uh, mostly was uh, in a lot of enthusiasm about it, you know, from people that were mad fans and like they weren't getting mad from mad anymore. So, um, you know, we would be doing something. And, and actually when we, when we decided to do all classic movies, uh, I think that got people even more excited because, you know, is if you hadn't seen the movie when Mad does a parody of it, it's a lot less fun than if you've seen it. And these movies, everybody's seen these movies, you know, or if, if right. you haven't, you've been actively trying not to. <laughs> yeah. But um, so so these are all timeless, you know, and that was one of Mad's biggest problems with the movie parodies um, mm -hmm. in the later years was that, you know, back in the day, movies were in theaters for six or eight months, you know, they were yeah. trickling down to the smaller theaters in smaller cities. And, and nowadays you're lucky if a movie makes it a whole month, you know, or six yeah, weeks in the theater. And that's the big ones. Um, we, we can't possibly write and, and draw no. and send it to them to edit and lay out in the sense of the prints are distributed mm -hmm. by that point. The DVD yeah. is classics, already, so. classics, Classics seem to be the way to go in, uh, in what in what you were doing. But how do you, how do you, I mean, certain films are, you know, like Citizen Kane, which I loved what you did with, I loved what you did with all of them. Uh, but how did you sort of come up with your list initially? It was sort of by feel. I mean, we knew we were doing, we knew we, did, we started with Star Wars, which isn't a classic movie, you know, because it, it was relatively recent, but Right. Once we knew we were going all in on the older movies, we, we thought we had the older movies and Star Wars for some which, um, But we just like gave movies back and forth. There wasn't a lot of like arguments about it. It was just sort of like just, you know, both of us made lists of things that were possible. I know Tom wanted to do Blade Runner right off the bat. And I was like, fine, that's great. Um, which movies did we choose for us? I know um, Shawshank Redemption was pretty early because it's like the number one movie on hmm. IMDb. So we know that there's a lot of people out there. Who really enjoyed it? That that's an example of a movie that didn't do great box office, and you know when it came out, and but then eventually they put it on TBS, you know, twelve times a day for a couple of years, and everybody, everybody <laughs> seen it, everybody likes it, so, so you can watch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Shawshank you know, was one that was almost immediate. Um, Goodfellas was one that we immediately yeah, yeah, yeah. knew we were going to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and what then. Else? The backers picked a few. Oh, right. right. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, what were some of the you, ones the backers you, picked out? People, people back, a group of backers, if you're whatever certain level, you got to vote on, you had to, first of all, it was two rounds. You got to suggest movies you want us to do. Mm -hmm. And we got hundreds of them, like, like hundreds of different movies. I mean, like, um, and so we went through them and the movies that were most mentioned, like I think the top 12, was it? Mm -hmm. like, the 12 movies that had the most backing of our backers, we put that onto like a ballot and then everybody got to vote on the three they wanted. And then the top three after that are the ones that went in. So that was um, <laughs> the Blues Brothers, Citizen Kane and um, Princess, Princess Bride. Bride. Yeah. Wow. I, I, I immediately opened the thing when I got it. I got the book and it's just, first of all, it's a gorgeous piece of work. If, if received it yet um you should take a look at this thing it's uh 
first of all, it's hardbound. Mm -hmm. uh, you spared no expense on the on the printing. It was just gorgeous. Um, it's hard to see on here, but take my word for it. Too, you know, no, <laughs> too glossy. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a little glossy, but it's not meant for TV. It's meant for you know. It's nice like though. Yeah, Tom was behind the production of that, and it, it's you know, it's it's good quality stuff, and you know, it, it also differentiates us a little bit from Mad, you know, that way because we're just you know, yeah, because certain, they always just certain, oh, a different look or feel to the thing, you know, even when yeah. it's something which we could have easily done in Mad. It's the uh, the other here's the King of Static Idling. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Well, Tom can tell you about that one. He could, that that was that was a side job we got. <laughs> really? Yeah, we. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got we got permission to put that in by Judd Apatow and Pete Davidson. He he commissioned Des and I to do that splash page uh, for his movie, The King of St Staten Island. Right. And he gave it to the cast. He like had prints made and gave it to the cast. Wow. And then when we were doing this book, I, I sent Judd a note and I said, hey, do you think you and Pete would mind if we put this in the book? Because I think people would really enjoy it. And he said, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, so, go uh, ahead. Just something most people it. had not seen. So it was, yeah. And, that's, it was and really I like some of, the middle, sort of thing. some of the middle stuff that you have. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's just such good material. Um, the, the, the right quote, wrong movie. Mm -hmm. Just... <laughs> So That's great, nice. underwritten. Um, now, gotten this a, was, yeah, go ahead. I said, I've gotten a lot of people who, who really appreciated the extra stuff. You know, I mean, they got the 12 movie parodies they were expecting, but right. they weren't expecting two or three page gag features in between or, you know, some of the some of the little stuff that we put in just as breathers between the uh, between the parodies and um, some of that is they they say that some of the the best stuff in there you know they they were surprised by that it made it feel more like actually reading mad you know mm -hmm. instead of yeah. just a book of parodies it has other stuff it's all movie related um but uh, different uh yeah ways, there's yeah. there's there's i the extra stuff was fun to do and we had told people we were going to do extra stuff, but they, everybody had a list of the movies. But, you know, long before we were finished, the 12 yeah. movies were set, and we had, had them on the page. Everybody knew which movies they'd be. They didn't know what we'd do with them, but they knew what they were going to get. And we also said there'd be extra material. We didn't tell anybody what that was going to be. So I think Those that's something nice that surprises. surprises. When you get the book, that's something that they didn't, you know. Yeah. They couldn't find it out until they got the book. There was no advance notice about it. So, so what did you, what did you, I, you know, it's one thing to write and draw for a magazine, and you have the whole backup of the editorial staff and the production staff and their printers and and all the stuff that they normally do. And you, you know, you write your piece or you draw your piece, you you collect your check and you move it on to the next one. What did you learn doing this? Well. We learned some of that stuff was real good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it was, it was, we, felt we basically had to do everything on this. So we were, we're writing it, we're drawing it. Tom's laying it out. He's doing the, you know, he's doing the balloons individually. Um, we had on the page, we had a weekly update. We're keeping in touch with all of our backers to let them know we really are out there working. And, you know, I think we wrote more on that than we wrote on the book. Um, <laughs> Her we, word. Tom uh, went to the distributor, so basically all of a sudden I have to get to deal with the business of like getting the thing printed and shipped and you know sent out. And so it's, you know, there's a, there's a lot a lot of details that we you know we, we knew they were coming, but we didn't know the mechanics or perhaps the scope of them until we were immersed in them. Right. Well, fortunately, yeah. I <coughs> excuse me, I had done a book um about t about twelve years earlier called The Mad Art of mm -hmm. Caricature, which is a how to draw mm -hmm. caricature book. You and get I that went book. through this. Yeah, I went through this whole process at that time, and I'd been working with a printer, you know, doing it for years because we we periodically reprint the book. So I was pretty familiar with the process, so the actual physical process of printing, which helped. Um, right. But uh, you know, I was I was not quite prepared for how much work it was going to be to do all the art production and layouts and book design and all that stuff you know uh that was all done for me with mad i get the whole layout with the text and everything in place and um doing the uh the titles you know uh yep. for each movie um some of them were easier than others 
but uh yeah i gained a new appreciation for the art department and uh production guys yeah. actually oh yeah i was at a, a mad event and sam viviano who is the art director of mad he said yeah yeah i, I, I bet you appreciate us now don't you I said hell yeah we do <laughs> I, I always appreciated the mint that we got uh, that uh, that was on uh, that was on Sam's uh, desk. Uh, right behind me right now, I'm running some of the videos that you ran on uh, on YouTube, Tom. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about about some of this stuff. Well, you know, while we were while we were producing the book, we wanted to, you know, give people a little. Uh, taste of what we were doing and and show them that we were making progress and you know kind of bring them into the process a little bit so i did this one where i inked this panel here that's from the shawshank redemption parody and um i did it live and people could ask me questions and and stuff while i was doing it and um and then i did another one i think where i was where i showed more of the color process i was coloring the splash page for goodfellas Oh yeah, we um, have I got that one too, I think. Yeah, and I and I, I think it was important. It was something that we wanted to make sure that we kept uh, a lot of communication lines open with our backers, you know, showed them that we were <laughs> uh um that we were not just sitting around, you know, uh wait, you know, procrastinating. We were actually working on this thing. And um you know, and I think it. Some people like the behind-the-scenes sort of stuff, and to see the see how the soup is made a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're looking at this stuff now, and it's just, you know, it's just gorgeous. Well, not not you, but the but the actual artwork itself is just so beautifully done. It, you know, it's certainly for people who are sort of aching and nostalgic for for Mad and for for what Mad had. Um, this certainly scratched that itch a little bit. What kind of reactions have you been getting from uh, from from the people who who bought the thing? Oh, it's been very positive. I think it's it's, it's a self selecting group, so you know they, they you know knew that they liked Mad. They knew they missed Mad. I mean, Mad's still out, but they're missing you know new material and. Yeah. Um, whatever i think they were very pleased with the way it turned out i mean that yeah it was a bit of a wait but you know when they got the, you know, the book you know it, it was like it was what they had hoped it would be we we tried to make it so it would be like for old mad fans they would they would get what they expected like they you know they knew they knew what parodies were like they knew what you know tom or I's work was like sometimes i guess um right. so so they so they got what they wanted but then we did other stuff that was different so it was, it was some something new and then some surprises you know some old stuff i, I mean some surprises and a mixture so basically it wouldn't just be you know the the old format of you know doing you know experiments and you know presentations that they hadn't seen before right i've gotten a lot of positive feedback um mostly you know we were we took us considerably longer to do the book than we expected so yeah. some people waited you know almost three years by the time they finally got the book um but I don't think anybody said to me, gee, that wasn't worth the wait. <laughs> oh, was everybody totally said, worth the wait. yeah, everybody said, in fact, I just did WonderCon this weekend. I just got back today from it. It was the first convention I've been to that I had copies of the book. Mm -hmm. And I had people come up, uh, backers and, and people that had already gotten a copy and, and just were, they said, you know, we, I knew it was going to be, one guy said to me, I knew it was going to be great and that I was going to, that my expectations were high and he says but this is this exceeded my very high expectations so i thought that was wow a, that was a great comment yeah yeah no, so I, I, got, I got some i got you know, i got some emails from backers you know just you know and they were profuse in how much they liked it and how you know you know satisfied how it you know, they kind of touched their heart as old mad fans and people didn't have to write those i mean we're, we didn't we didn't solicit you send us your response please you know so people sort of like felt that it would be a nice thing to do to let us know how much, you know, they liked what we did because maybe we'd like hearing it from them, which we did. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was great. Was there, was there anything that you guys were able to do in this that you might not have been permitted to do in, in mad magazine? 
Um, not, not tons not, of stuff. I, yeah, I mean, not so much in terms of content, but you know, in terms of length, for sure. I mean, we have a few a few parodies that are like you know, not eight, nine, ten pages. Mm-hmm. You know, man doesn't really, never really did those as a, a habitual thing. Um, I I don't think we would have been allowed to do the um, sideways uh, splash page for Die Hard. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe we could have pitched that and gotten him to do it. It would have been a conversation. But, I don't know how it would yeah, turn out. Yeah, <laughs> that would have been fun. Uh, I think that I think Dez's writing is a little edgier than uh, the current, you know, mad corporate behemoth would have allowed. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't uh, we didn't go crazy with that, and like I. We we decided early on we weren't going to put any any you know serious curse words in there. We were just going to use the cartoon versions of them, um, which you know meant that most of the dialogue in Goodfellas was just a bunch of uh, asterisks and things like that. <laughs> Lebowski's like that, <laughs> um, but 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 we, the, the squiggles and stuff we used we actually kind of are closer to the real words. So there's no it's a thinner veil being <laughs> just to make things obvious. <laughs> yeah. I don't think um, I think that if you looked at it, anybody that that was a mad fan and didn't know the background, you know, the background uh, story mm-hmm. would recognize this stuff immediately as as mad. You know, uh, the type of parodies that they would see in mad, it wouldn't be anything that would stick out to them like, oh, this would have never been in mad. But we just got to spread our wings a little bit. I mean, the Citizen Kane parody with the with I wanted the, to uh, ask you about that. Yeah. That's that's that, they might not have I, done that. Who knows? But, yeah, I don't think they would have let us do that. Mm-hmm. So talk about that one because for the people who haven't seen this yet, and I'm gonna pull this out just because I didn't put the whole thing in there. But the Citizen Kane thing, what you guys did in there was to sort of take the um take the old style that Mad did back in the 50s, early, early on, and sort of parody that style. Talk to me about that, how that evolved, because that was just a stroke of genius. Yeah. Well, I had the idea to do it, but Tom's the one who had to do it. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot easier to come up with the idea and that, for something like that. Um, basically, it's the oldest movie we parodied, because 1941. Mm-hmm. So, and I think the second oldest is like 1960. So, it's a, big, it's a big jump backwards to Citizen Kane. And I thought, well, let's do an old-style parody of an old-style movie. And doing the man, yeah, you know, doing the man, <coughs> Harvey Kurtzman, you know, Will Elder, Wally Wood, Jack Davis, you know, um, John Severin. We thought, you know, that would be something to do. And basically, um, Tom didn't want to do like, you know, a, like do an imitation of that. So he was like, sort of like get his own feel. And I just said, you know, pretend you were an artist back then, and how would you have drawn it? <laughs> and I don't know, actually, why should Tom's here? Why should I say what he was thinking? <laughs> yeah, well, why should you tell me what he was thinking? Yeah, I, I didn't want to, you know, do an overt, um, like uh, we did uh, the, the very first Burbank issue of Mad, there was a parody of the Riverdale TV show, and the first couple of pages, we did a starchy uh, reconstitute, it was called, and it was started out uh, as, as, a, as a sequel to the starchy parody from way back when, and um the early mad comic book days with will elder's art and i did a i mean that that was i had to do a a flat out will elder impression on that i mean that was part of the gag and then they went into a time machine and got um uh transported to 2018 or whatever it was that the tv show was on and now they look like the actors uh instead of being the characters from starchy but uh in this case i didn't i didn't want to ape you know anybody's particular style too much but i wanted it to really make sure it looked a lot like the the early comic book days and i guess you know at, in the end it ended up just being a lot of wallywood ish looking art um, right. i couldn't i couldn't disconnect myself from that because that's that's who i associate that that era with you know um even though Jack and in and Bill Elder and those guys were as as prolific as Wood, but Wood stuff was always what really resonated with me. And of course, we had to do this in black and white. Yeah. <laughs> and the mad the mad comics were color. So, so 
So that was a different thing. So I, I kind of went back to the mo more of the 60s style of um, grayscaling, you know, with uh, the craft tint uh, yeah. type um, uh, gradations where you use use the craft tint paper or zip -a tone uh, type patterns. And I, I created a bunch of those and, and used them. And so, so it was sort of a, a combination of the fifties comic book style of art and the s more sixties magazine, um, type of grays. So it's kind of a it looked, mishmash. It looked like the whole thing was really a labor of love for, for both of you. It was, was it? talking about the talking about the parody that Tom did. I when um, when I was writing that, um, I went back and like literally went through all of the comic book stories, and I was literally like counting the number of words per paragraph, like uh, <laughs> uh, you know, per paragraph. really words per, word word boy. I said, well, I want it. I've I've seen other parodies of EC comics or EC comics mad, and mad uh -huh. style comics before. Some of the undergrounds did other people did that, but so yeah. many of them like were kind of lame. It was sort of like they do they draw it. Kind of like that, and they and someone would say, you know, how's your mom, Ed? Or they'd say, uh, you know, um, you know, they call somebody Melvin, and then, haha, my job's done. I was like, parodied, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, a lot of them are not, they're they want to be like that, but they're not, don't know really the flavor of it and the, the heart of it. So I, I really like kind of deconstructed the things. It's like how often. Are there short balloons? How often are there long balloons? I was counting the number of panels per page and the pacing. So I think I think every page of the Citizen Kane thing has like a three-panel sequence of physical comedy of, of action. So and, and which, yeah. which which Kurtzman used all the time. Like everybody yeah. um, And also I was like trying to give Tom things to draw that would be you know funny you know um, as well. So um, so really it was it was like a little you know thesis on you know how those things were put together. And so I so I, was, so I get the exact format down, and then I could do the stuff that I do that's not you know Kurtzmanian. <laughs> Right, and then then there's the stuff that's like the chicken fat, as they as they called mm -hmm. it back in the right. day. But how much of that was was just Tom? How much of it was you? Sort of yes, making suggestions? Wait, 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 wait. it was. It was me and Tom. <laughs> um, I, I I always put the stuff in the script, and it's like, I, but it's, it's sort of like time. It's like a menu. Like you know, use what you want, ignore what you want. If you see something, it's you sort of like it. You can make it better. Do that. And he comes up with his own stuff and puts that in. It's, it's a, right. just a mishmash of all directions. Well, yeah, we have a few. You yeah, could. Des go was always, of all the writers I worked with at MAD, Des was one that did a lot of suggesting of visual gags mm -hmm. um, in the script, which I always appreciated. Although he, he would drive me crazy a lot because he would write in a visual gag that I had already planned on doing. And then I was like, mm, damn, I've, he's got to get credit <laughs> for that now. Um, off the past. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. but other writers wouldn't so much, you know, I think, uh, Dick DiBartolo used to suggest, you know, things here and there. Arnie Kogan hardly ever did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so really? I was already used to, you know, Des's suggestions and we, we have a similar sense of humor. So he would suggest gags that I would have, you know, maybe come up with myself or at least were ones that I really thought were funny because that's exactly my wheelhouse, you know? And, um, right. uh, but yeah, so, so a lot of them are Des's, a lot of them are mine. We'd have to go through. I wouldn't even be able to identify which was which hardly anymore. Yeah, in some <laughs> cases, I, mean, I might, I might think that I, I did one of his or he did one of mine. I just wouldn't be correct. <laughs> it really, it really yeah, merged together. It was, a, it was an ongoing process of, you know, some, I, I oh, gave him some ideas that you use this anywhere. It wasn't like use this on page three, panel two. It's like just sort of right. things you could throw out there and other things are very specific to a particular word balloon or a character action or something. So, and then, but so Tom's you, always a layer. I get the RB all new stuff in there too. So it's great. <laughs> That's fantastic. So you guys worked at, at Mad Magazine in the, in the, in the last portion of the history of Mad uh, I wouldn't mind talking to each of you a little bit. And again, uh, you know, I'll remind our viewers that we're live right now. If anybody wants to make a comment right. in the comments and answer <laughs> questions. Um, but uh, so while you got the chance, here are these legends, these legends, guys. Um, uh, how, I'd like to get your each of your origin stories. Des, if, if you wouldn't mind 
sort of talking about it since I think you were there first. What was your yeah. uh, how, well, tell me about the beginnings of your world at MAD. Okay. Well, I wound up there. I was, I was at MAD for more than half the time there was a MAD. So can I, I go back a little earlier than time? Um, when, I, when I was in high school, um, probably about 15 years old, I started doing a monthly humor magazine of my own. And I wow. would write it and draw it and, you know, make copies of it, you know, and, you know, circulation like 120, 140, whatever it was. And I would sell it to the, you know, to the teachers and the students and that's how I'd make some money. And anyway, so I did that for like three years you know, um, in, during high school. And in senior year, uh, it was getting, you know, just um, getting towards the you know, second half of the year. And I said, well, so I called up Mad. I just cold called him and said, uh, you know, hi, I've you know, been doing this thing in magazine. Can I, you know, can I ever come in and show it to somebody, you know, and talk to them? And the person on the phone goes, yeah, come tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I can't come tomorrow. I'm in high school. I got class tomorrow. He said, come the day after tomorrow. <laughs> so I literally cut class the day after tomorrow. And I went in and um, it met with um, John Ficarra and Nick Magnin, um Wow. There at the time. And basically they you know, brought me into the office. They looked through my stuff, which was, you know, something less than professional. But um they, um, John in particular saw some kind of promise and I don't know what. I, I always have in the back of my head, I think maybe they saw that I did it monthly. I was doing 12 pages of comedy per month every month for three years. And so at least that shows a work ethic or it shows, you know, ability to produce. Um, so, and basically John said, okay, you know, you gave me the whole rundown of how, you know, th things are set, you know, there, how, how things are submitted. He gave me a, a script from Tom Cook, who was one of the Great writers of ad from like the 50s into the 90s. And so I could see the format of how he put together his submissions. I said, send them to me. Like, don't just send them to me on to mad. Give them to me and you know, I'll look at them faster. And so I did that. So I was sending stuff for a year and a half or something before I sold something. Um, well, I was 19 when I sold my first piece. So it, it went pretty well. But um, and also while they had me in the office, and also when they were done with me. And my stupid collection of you know high school humor. Um, they started quizzing me as I was doing. You know, what's your favorite? Who's your favorite artist? Who's your favorite writer? What's your favorite type of article? You know, what's your favorite article we don't do anymore that you think we should bring back? And and, oh. and they liked my answers too. So in, so in addition to like my work ethic, um, I gave I apparently gave answers that were less. You know, they, they said who's your favorite artist? And I say Don Martin or something like that. I, I think I said um, George Woodbridge. And, oh, very uh, nice. and Paul Coker. <laughs> And there's oh, and I said, and it's oh, everybody says Don Martin. I said, yeah, well, I like Don Martin too. I said, well, yeah, well, I like these guys. I said, well, we know they're good. We do every day. <laughs> People don't say them as much. Um, and then especially when they said, what's the thing we don't do anymore that you wish we'd bring back? And I said, it's the stuff that Max Brandel used to do. He used to do these um, photographic heavy um, things about you know sort of current events or social trends and. Um, and they saw it. Ah, like yeah, now Max Brandel wasn't alive anymore. That's the reason they stopped doing it. But they said, "Oh, good reason." I, you know, so I, 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 I hit something that they really appreciated as well. So, so, I, so I, I did a good interview, and so, but it still took quite a while to, like, you know, sell a first piece, and then still longer to really establish myself in the magazine. That took a few years. What was your first article you sold? First article that I sold was, um, it was the the. Well, the first article I sold and the first article that appeared in print are two different things. The first article I sold was on the exploitation of a rock death. And basically, I made up an imaginary rock musician. And right at the start of the article, he dies. And then the rest of the article is how everybody responds to it and exploits it and profits from it. And so it's like, what what are the what does the manager do? What does the TV stations do? What do the fans do? And so, and that, that was that was, you know. That wasn't such a bad article. Some of my early stuff, I look back and go, well, you know, it was early stuff. That, that, that article holds up a little better. But the first article that appeared in print was a, it was the 1984 quiz. And that was like a tactical attack approach on mine because I was, I was still trying to figure out how do you crack the things they want to take. And I started thinking, well, there's stuff happening in 1984. You got a presidential election at the end. You have an Olympics coming up in the second half. And, and there were a couple other things that were going to happen. You knew like a year and a half in advance or a year in advance. Right. So, so they can write jokes about those. And then basically, if I give it to them, then they'll have it well in advance. We'll be able to print it exactly at the end of 1984. <laughs> um, and it worked. <laughs> so. 
Very, uh, very. That's not, that article's not as good as the other one, but it's you know that's how I started. And and you, Tom, where what 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 what's your mad origin story? Well, I had done some comic book work in the early '90s, um, and uh, was doing magazine illustration and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but I got a job doing caricatures uh, at a theme park when I was going to college. And that's how I sort of fell in love with the art of caricature. And that became a real focus for my illustration career uh, because it's a great, it's a great thing to be able to do if you want to uh, be an illustrator, because getting likenesses of people is always uh, something that people can use, you know? And of course, MAD was the greatest place in the world to do caricatures. Um, so in the late, uh, in like 99, I was president of a, of a group, a professional organization of caricature artists that at the time was called the National Caricaturist Network. It's now called the International Society of Caricaturists. But uh, we had a mini convention in New Britain, Connecticut, of all places. There was a Hirschfeld show that was being uh, starting there. And I was in charge of inviting a guest speaker. So I called up Sam Viviano, who was just took over as the art director of MAD and asked him if he would be a guest speaker. So he, he came uh, to do it. And I, in the meantime, wrote and drew a movie parody of the movie Godzilla with uh, Matthew Broderick in it from like 98 and uh, to show him as a sample to see if I could get some work in Mad, uh, and he looked at it and he thought he he liked it. He he you know said, "Well, your work isn't quite there yet for Mad, but please keep sending me stuff." And uh, so I went back home with that piece, and at that same time, Cracked Magazine had just been bought by American Media and was on the uh, slag heap, and they were trying to figure out how to. Uh, make it profitable. So they basically cut their page rates to zero and Ooh, good. Uh, nicely uh, done. Yeah. John Severin and, uh, you know, and all the people that they had that work with them said, we're not going to do this. And so they didn't have any artists. So they were looking for, for content. And I sent them that Godzilla parody and they immediately published it like, you know, wow. two-year-old movie and <laughs> they did the parody anyway. <clears throat> so I ended up doing some work for Cracked, but every time I would do a, a movie or a TV parody for Cracked, uh, as soon as I got finished with it, I'd send it to Sam and, and have him see it. And, you know, we had back and forth and he kept on giving me pointers and saying this or that. And then the Rubin Awards, the NCS Rubin Awards took place in New York in, in uh, 2000, May. And, um, I went there and I had just done a mo movie parody for Cracked uh, was um, Gladiator, Gladiator, <clears throat> Gladiator with uh, Russell Crowe. And so I showed that to Sam and Nick Meglin was there too. And uh, this time they really thought, okay, this is what we're looking for. Um, we'd love to, you know, give you some work some at some point. But you can't uh, you can't have a byline in Cracked and Mad at the same time. It's a rule. And I said, that's OK. I don't work for Cracked anymore. And <laughs> Sam said, when did that happen? And I said, three Just seconds Sam. ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Sam said, well, wait a minute now. I can't promise you. It might be it might be six months before I can give you a job or who knows. You know, I. I um, and I said, that's okay. You know, I'd kind of had it with cracked anyway. They didn't pay very well and they, uh -huh. they do weird, did weird things with the art. And so, uh, it was a couple of months later, they, they gave me an assignment and like Des, the first assignment I got from them is not the first assignment that saw print. So especially with artists anyway, they would often assign you an evergreen piece, which what they called it an evergreen piece because it, it wasn't a timely thing. They could run right. at any time. And um, so it was, uh, let's see, it was mad TV, uh, cable TV betting odds. And um, the, uh, uh, I can't remember who wrote it. Um, I think Jack, didn't he? No, 
Dick oh. wrote the first piece that was in that was in. Oh, uh, that's okay. Yeah, that's on yeah. Jay Preet, that's the guy that wrote it, which which I think is uh Fikara, isn't it? Oh uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was a secret probably doesn't have to be anymore. <laughs> oh no, he doesn't care. Um, but uh, uh, I did that piece, and I get and I sent it in, and they said, "Oh, yeah, this is great, but we, you know, we're not going to run it right away. It's going to sit in the evergreen drawer, and it'll it'll go at some point, you know." But uh, but we did like it. Just wanted to let you know that, and um, didn't get another job form for like three months, mm -hmm. and I I thought, oh, I blew it, you know. They said they liked it, but they didn't really like it. And who knows? You know, I'll never, I'll never, I have my chance at Mad Magazine and, and I'm not going to get in there. Then, then they called me and said, yeah, we've got a piece for you to do. And this was, this was uh, written by Dick DiBartolo and it was called How to Make Your Home Theater More Like Going to the Movies. And it was just a big two page <laughs> spread of somebody's basement with a big screen TV in it. And then all these gadgets that were that made it more like you were really at the movies. So there was a sticky floor mat in front of you that your feet would stick to, um, in front of your couch. And then there was a an arm, uh, a mechanical arm that elbowed your your uh, arm off the armrest. Uh, <laughs> that sort of stuff. So that was fun, and and that I did that piece, and it it was published in uh, issue three ninety nine. Uh, was the first issue that I was in, which um, incidentally is the very last completely black and white old paper stock wow. Mad Magazine. And then in uh, 400, they used a slicker paper and uh, had a lot of color in it. And then they had a couple of issues that were uh, half black and white and half color on the slicker stock. And then they went to color, I think with 403, 402, 403. So um, I, I was in one issue <laughs> of the old black and white crappy paper, uh, classic mad magazine. Well, clearly and, once uh, you, once you did two you black and white board, things, you clap them. So yeah, that's true. That's what, Clear, clearly, once you came aboard, Tom, they realized they couldn't just do black and white anymore. They had to upgrade to. to you know, <laughs> well, to Sam does not denies this. Sam says it was just a coincidence, but I'm I'm convinced that one of the reasons I did get to do work for Mad was that they were planning on switching to color. Oh, interesting. And they they were much more enthusiastic about people that did color work, especially that could do it digitally mm -hmm. um, and work quickly in color for pieces that were going to be in color in the magazine. So Sam says, no, it was just a coincidence, but well, for a while, they took some of their older stuff for a while. They took some of their older stuff. I know. And they, they just had colorists come in and just sort of look for some of the people who did not generally work in color. Well, they did that, especially later on. It's that we were reprinting things. Sometimes they color the things to make them look newer, or I guess, or something different. I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, and and I still did a few black and white pieces, you know, in the first couple of years. And not everything was in color, but um, Mort, for example, refused to color his stuff. So right. anytime, anytime he did a TV or a movie parody, it was in black and white. Right, um, and he also he also was very adamant that they not color or recolor his old stuff. Oh yeah, definitely. Like some things were reprinted in color, but never Mort's. Stuff. He 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 had that pass forever for years. I did the first Harry Potter movie and he drew it in black and white. I did three hundred and he drew that in black and white. He just you know he preferred black and white to color. So yeah. I said, well, well you're more drunk. You will we'll do it your way. He's more. He's more drunk. Yeah. But what are you going to do? Argue with Mort? Yeah. No, <laughs> I would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. No. You the thing Tom said before me. about how he's like he did his first assignment. There was like three months for another assignment. I was I, I was on the last mad trip ever. I was I was like you know I was sort of like the new guy at the end of like what was that? That was to the Jersey Shore, as I recall, right? Yeah, well, it was probably would have been at that point if, if DC had its way. You know, they, they did not. This, they, Bill Gates planned the trip and then he passed away, and DC was interested in canceling the trip, but it was already underway, so they had to like just live with it. They never understood mm -hmm. Mad's way of doing things um, in terms of you know bo bonuses and business sense, but. Um, so I, that, that was to Monaco over in Monte Carlo. Oh, nice. um, that was the that was the final mad trip. But I was on the plane sitting next to Tom Bunk, and he Ooh. was saying, you know, like, you know, I don't have anything to draw for them. They haven't given me any assignments. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and, and he's, he's worried. He doesn't, you know, doesn't know when he's going to get it. You know, he's just concerned. I said, well, I don't get assignments. I got to create my own assignments. If I don't write mm-hmm. something, there's no assignments. And if I write something, I don't like it. There's no assignments. And so the students are trying to, well, who's worse off? You know, which, which who's more anxiety <laughs> about that you know, future work? So we can decide. I think I thought it was him and he thought it was me. Or something like that. <laughs> I never, I never got to go on a mad trip. I knew Bill. I got to, you know, meet him, interact with him a little bit. He was, he was mm-hmm. an interesting guy. It's always fun to meet your, uh, the idols that you grew up with. I guess, Tom, you were, you came in a little uh, after Bill's time. Yes. Yeah, Bill had Bill had passed away uh, ten years before I started with Mad. So you're probably a little it's less miraculous. It's it's a, it's it's kind of a tribute to uh, to Nick and, and yeah, I met to I met John. Bill a number of times, but it was not you know he 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 liked the guys he knew. So so I said you know we say you said hello to me that kind of thing. It wasn't much more than that. But actually, um, when I was a kid, mm-hmm. um, I, I I found somehow somebody found you could do a tour of the Mad offices. Right. And they did this to people. I, I mean, they didn't put it in the magazine. They didn't say, hey, come on down. But somehow a lot of people found out about this. So I went down to, to the tour. They showed showed you the office. The office is as big as an apartment building almost. I mean, apartments, uh, apartment in a building. So it wasn't big offices. But so I saw the thing. And then for some reason, I, there was a second time. So I, I went the second time, but I already knew what I had seen. So I started like broke or sort of wandering around <laughs> as far as – I go in the office and there's like a gorilla in a window. So I go and look yes. out there when I'm looking around and then all of a sudden I hear this voice go, hello, this big booming voice. I turn around and it's Bill Gaines. So I walked into his office and he was just sitting there watching me you know, go through his you know, stuff. And I kind of went, ah, and I ran out of the room because I knew who he was from reading Mad. <laughs> so that was my first interaction <laughs> with Bill Gaines ever was like, you know, being startled by everything and scooting out like, oops, I'm not supposed to be here. Oh man, his office, his office was, was, uh, was really something with yeah. the, just the Zeppelins all over the place, statues of yeah. liberty, statue of liberties and, uh-huh. uh, and King Kong staring at, and all too- the windows, all the windows in the mad offices were all like boarded up for some reason. They, there were no not in the windows. art department. So I'm John putting on the art department. They, they were going to give him an office without windows. And he said, I'm, I'm not going to work here anymore. I'm quitting. And he said, Oh, and they had to redo the whole like you know uh, who got what room because he said he would not stay with artificial light he needed natural light so yeah. Yeah, bill gates also had two photos on his desk there's a photo of fatty orbuckle and virginia rapp who was like the woman who died at the party that he got accused of and he would tell people that's his mother and father so there's my, there's my parents you know <laughs> but he thought it was nice <laughs> to have them <laughs> on his desk. yeah i would buy it's that a lot of stuff at Gay's office. It's very crowded and personal. Well, I, that, my, so before we wrap up, my other question is because you guys obviously did this thing because Mad kind of shut down. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, the, what's 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 there now is just sort of reprints and stuff. And I'm sure the people who took over in Burbank were very nice. But yeah. you guys made the transition, you know, from okay, we're closing down New York Mad. We're stopping the numbering. We're going to start from scratch again. They mm-hmm. brought in new editorial. They brought in a lot of new people, talent. Uh, right. You two were a couple of the ones who actually made the cut when it was when it was time to transition. Yeah, there were a few others besides us, but yeah. Yeah, but what was that transition period like and, and you know, for you guys, and what was it like to sort of be part of that and to watch that thing happen? Tom, do you have a audio? Sorry, okay, I muted my mic because I was uh, I was coughing. That they <laughs> wanted to listen to that. Um, I would have. The uh, yeah, you know, obviously nobody wanted that to happen. Um, it was great. You know, I I feel very lucky that I was able to be a part of Mad when Nick Meglin was there and mm-hmm. and John Ficara mm-hmm. and and uh, Charlie and Joe and some of these guys that have been there for a long time and and it was still very much the bill Gaines mad um and then the thing that concerned me about moving to burbank was there was no uh nobody in editorial would have ever have you know worked with bill or with nick or any of those guys you know there was always a natural progression 
between institutional continuity. Yeah. 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 You know, he had, he had Kurtzman and then Feldstein took over and then Feldstein was there for a long time. And, you know, Nick was working with them and John came in and, and so, so there was a, there was a natural evolution, you know, with uh, institutional wisdom. Yeah. And that was all done, you know, and I'm great friends with Bill Morrison. He's a good friend of mine. And, and I thought he was a great choice. If you had to pick somebody to be the editor, uh, Bill was a great choice because he, he understood mad, you know, he loved mad. He, I think he got the whole, what makes mad mad thing. Um, and I just don't think they really gave him a chance. I think they, they opened it up there and, and tied, tied everybody's hands behind their back and, and said, well, try to make this work. And, and it was an impossible situation, but right. personally, I mean, as far as my work goes, that didn't change much. You know, I was still doing parodies that Des wrote and right. <laughs> still working on, you know, some stuff that Dick did and, and, um, you know, I had a new art director, but Susie was great to work with because she leaned on me for a lot of the, the aesthetics because I knew what they were about, you know? So, right. and I don't know if, you know, how, how does, how your stuff went as far as with the editors, but working with the art department was, they were like, so how do you think this page ought to work? You know, or, right. and I'd say, wait a minute now, you don't have the gutters in the right place. You got to leave room for Sergio's marginals here, you know, and they'd say, oh yeah, okay. So, uh, um, but uh, it was kind of business as usual, really, as far as the creation goes, yeah. um, even with uh, Burbank. Yes, you want to weigh in? Oh, I um, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I always did my own stuff, you know, from my house. And I, uh, you know, there was some, there was a little less communication. I think they were sort of overwhelmed. So I didn't, it wasn't like you know, they didn't want to you know, blow me off or something. I right. think basically they're trying to figure out, like, what do we do? How does this happen? And and the corporate, you know, you know, level above them, I don't think we're giving them the kind of, you know, help or encouragement or, you know, you know, assistance they needed. So it's really like, you know, being thrown into the deep end of the pool and, you know, trying to get to the other side. Um, so basically, you know, I'd I, I send stuff in, but I, so I, I think it, it was a little more remote, but it was probably it was a matter of circumstances rather than, you know, personality or intention or anything like that. Right. Because I mean, otherwise, yeah, I, 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 you know, Bill had some good ideas for one of the articles. I always think, you know, he made, you know, some editorial, you know, switch in there and it was a good idea. So, I mean, I, you know, if, if they were still around, I'm sure they'd be in the swing of things much more than they were able or allowed to be back then. Yeah, they could, they could have sort of got chopped off at the knees very quickly. Mm -hmm. I think coming in the door in a lot of ways. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, gentlemen, we're, we're going to wrap up. It's been uh, it's almost an hour now. Look at that. And um, what, so, so far, nobody gave us any questions, so that made – <laughs> my life more difficult thanks audience uh but you guys made my life easier so i appreciate that now where can people get uh a copy of claptrap or is this like the only copy and i can put it up for like a lot of money now we've got lots of copies left over we basically blew all our money on extra printing extra copies um so we would have, you know, some for people after after the, all the fulfillment was done. So we got lots of copies. Best place to get it is just directly from us. Um, okay. Right. You go. They go to the URL claptrapbook.com, and uh, okay. that's that'll take you to all the different flavors. You can get one that's signed. You can get one that's. We don't have any upside down copies left. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Those are oh, those are all sold those out. Those are those but, are valuable uh, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, if you've what got one, you know, you I have one copy. Book. I have one copy that just by accident, we both, both, I was at um, Tom's house, we we're signing all the books and doing the last, you know, parts before the shipment. And uh, I got a copy. And somehow, both of us signed it uh, upside down on the last in, in, in inside page, like the back cover. Oh, we're like, really? You were doing it so fast. Literally, it's like both of our signatures are in there, just our names, and they're, they're upside down because we thought we were signing the front cover. So oh I'm sure that's not worth anything, but it's an you know, odd thing to have. Yeah, so, that's weird. Oh, yeah, so anyway, if you want to get a copy of Claptrap, also you can if, um, you can always like just type in Claptrap plus Richmond into Google, and it'll it's the first things that pop up. Well, the links, look, so. I, look, 
look, I was able to get it up on the screen. It's, it's up there now. Yeah, there you go. It's That's very it. exciting. That works. Okay, now I've now I've used the I'm, I'm using Streamyard. It's my new program. So this mm -hmm. is my first time, guys, doing an official program with this oh. particular software. And I know you're very excited about. I would that. never know that because I don't know anything about it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there you go, gentlemen. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I, I miss seeing you guys in person at the mad parties and at various mm -hmm. functions. Uh, what are you working on now before we go? And then uh, and and then we'll say goodbye. Well, Des, what do you got um, going? I've, I've been sort of noodling around with another book project. It's nothing like Claptrap. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't like to talk about stuff in the middle of because I always feel... You know, somehow I feel like if you're talking about, it, you're not doing. It. So, and a lot, I know a lot of people who will talk and talk about things they're planning to do. Well, so. if you're on the Tonight Show, you know you'd want to you want to be able to promote something. Well, so. I have to have it. It's not it's not done. So I, I don't you know I certainly mention it when I get it done. Okay. <laughs> and and you talk. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I I've, I've been doing some work for Mad the last uh, month or so. Um, I did the cover of the next issue, and then they've got this these Barnes and Noble collections that come out every other month. Um, and I, I'm just did a cover for that. I'm doing another cover for that. Uh, I do a lot of work for the comedian, Jeff Dunham. Oh, um, wow. That's great. A lot, of, a lot of art for his tours and his merchandise and stuff. He keeps me pretty busy doing stuff like that. Um, and then it's, it's kind of convention season right now. I do a couple, I'm going to be at San Diego and I'm going to be at C2E2 in Chicago and uh, New York. And um, so I'm going to have a new sketch of the week book I'm putting together and probably some new prints and that type of thing. But uh, otherwise, just the usual client stuff, you know. Nice. And people can get caricatures from you, right? They can do commissions at your website. Uh, I don't do. Yeah, sort of. I don't do too many personal commissions uh, all the time. But when I uh, when I do Comic Cons, I do these virtual Comic Con events and then people oh, can get nice. commissions from me at that time. Mm -hmm. So. I will be doing one during C2E2. So like I can put you on the cover of mad or whatever. It's just a, a fun thing to be able to do. Um, sure, but uh, yeah. And then um, we'll see what else comes down the road. If you want, go, go to convention for time. You get a copy of Claptrap, I'm sure. Right. Yeah. We'll have, a, we'll have copies. I sold a bunch at, uh, at WonderCon this weekend. Fantastic. So um, yeah. Yeah. You bet. Guys, thank you so much, um, and I get, and I guess I'll see you soon. And we will be doing doing more. Ask them yourselves, where you will be able to actually not listen to and talk, ask questions of anybody if you prefer not to talk to people. You know, you, we give you this, <laughs> we give you this wonderful opportunity to to talk to legends, and and you just you just turn us down. So <laughs> listen, buy claptrap. Uh, and uh, and talk to these guys uh, at the at the comic cons, which cost a lot more than this does. And mm. thanks for watching, guys. Talk to you soon. Thanks to you, Jay. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. You guys stay with me for a second after I end the stream. Okay. okay.